Peace be with you. Let us pray. God, Holy Spirit, you are holy, and yet you choose to dwell in frail human beings. Your love for us is deep, and your concern for each one of us is unimaginable. As we gather to pray, as we gather waiting on you, fill us with all the graces we need to serve you in holiness. Grant this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, dear friends, uh, welcome to day 16 of our 30-day retreat and our topic for today is the charisms part four and i like to start with a little bit of history sometime in the fifth century a.d when the roman empire was experiencing decline, particularly the city of Rome had been brought to her knees on account of the attack of enemies. And the inhabitants of Rome, the non-Christians, started accusing the Christians. They argued that it was because the Christian faith had substituted the worship of the gods of uh, the city of Rome, that was why the city had been brought to its knees. So St. Augustine decided to respond to that allegation. And he did that by writing uh, a literary masterpiece known as the City of God. It is believed that he wrote around the year 413 AD. And I like to quote portions of what St. Augustine says in that book because he touches on charisms there. First and foremost, St. Augustine says, and I'm quoting him, For even now, miracles are wrought in the name of Christ, whether by his sacraments, or by the prayers or relics of his saints. End of quote. Then St. Augustine in that book goes ahead and gives numerous examples of miracles happening during his time. And for, for lack of time, uh, let me share just one of the uh, testimonies that St. Augustine uh, uh, recalls in that book. And I'm quoting him. In the same city of Carthage lived Innocentia, a very devout woman of the highest rank in the state. She had cancer in one of her breasts, a disease which, as physicians say, is incurable. She betook herself to God alone by prayer. On the approach of Easter, she was instructed in a dream to wait for the first woman that came out of the baptistry after being baptized and to ask her to make the sign of Christ upon her soul. She did so and was immediately cured and of coat. The point we seek to make here is that miracles, healing, these charisms have been at work in the church. For the past few days, we have been reflecting on the various charisms enumerated by Paul in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, specifically, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. Uh, so far, we have looked at charisms like uh, tongues speaking, uh, interpretation of tongues, uh, prophecy, We've also looked at uh, 
uh, wisdom, we've looked at knowledge, and we've looked at discernment of spirits. Today, we are looking at uh, charisms that would fall under what people would call power to do. So, three charisms here. We're looking at uh, faith, uh, miracles, and uh, healing. And I'd like to say right from the beginning that these three are interrelated. In fact, all the charisms are connected. So you cannot really make a, a, a watertight distinction between faith, miracles, and healing. They are connected. But we'll try to see how best, with the help of the Holy Spirit, expound on, on these topics. Let's take the uh, charism of faith. And we'd like to start by making a distinction between the virtue of faith and the charism of faith. The virtue of faith is what we profess and celebrate in common as Christians. For example, in baptism, we celebrate the virtue of faith. When we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, we are celebrating the virtue of faith. When we gather to celebrate confirmation, we are celebrating the virtue of faith. When two or three people are gathered in the name of the Lord, they are celebrating the virtue of faith. During this 30-day retreat, we are celebrating the virtue of faith. So that is the virtue of faith. The charism of faith, on the other hand, is an unusual, intense trust in the ability of God even in the face of what appears to be impossible. And let me give an example in the Bible, in Acts chapter 3, where we are told that uh, Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. And as they were going, they would meet a, a, a lame man, a man lame from birth, uh, who was put at the temple entrance, the temple gate, as a beautiful gate. To ask alms of those who enter the temple. Now we read from uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 3, following that seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him with John and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention upon them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. So Peter exercised the charism of faith. He says, I'm going to give you what I have. And he had deep faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith was translated into healing for this man. You can read the full text in Acts chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 10. So here we have a clear example of uh, Peter exercising the charism of faith. Now let's come to the uh, charism of uh, miracle. And here I also would like to make a distinction. A distinction between uh, magic and miracle. In magic, the focus is on the magician. In a miracle, the focus is on God. Again, magic is theatrical, about theater, performance. Miracle is ministerial, it's about ministry, it's about service. So there's a distinction. Miracles do not violate the laws of nature. They transcend the laws of nature. And that is why they are referred to as a supernatural. They are above the natural. And when we look at the text of 1 Corinthians, the word that is translated as a miracle is dynamis, power. So it's an expression of divine power where something which is impossible becomes possible. And let's look at an example. We also go again to the uh, Acts of the Apostles, 
uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 36 to verse 43. You can read the whole, the full story there, but I'll just give some few highlights. We are told that now there was a Joppa, a disciple named Tabitha, which means Docas or Gazelle. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. First track, verse 40. Peter now comes. So, but Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. Then turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And he became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon Etana. Of particular emphasis is in verse 42. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. That is the effect of a miracle. It leads to faith in the Lord. It leads to conversion. It leads to repentance. It leads to renewal. And miracles are God's way of calling our attention to his presence in our world. So that is an example of the charism of a miracle being exercised. Then we come to the uh, uh, charism of healing. Uh, here I like to make uh, some distinctions as well. First and foremost, we have what we call natural healing. And here, medicine can also fall into that category that people go to school, they learn about uh, the world, about humanity, about uh, medicine, and based upon their knowledge, they are able to offer us the right medication and we get well. This is in the sphere of the natural. Uh, and we thank God for the lives of all our doctors and nurses, especially during this time. May God bless you for all the sacrifices you are making and may God strengthen you. We appreciate you, all of you. But this falls within the natural sphere. Again, within the broader spectrum of our healing, we also have what we call the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. So here, when the church prays for sick people, so a priest will go and anoint a person who is sick. Now this falls under the sacrament of uh, anointing of the sick. Then the third one is the charism of healing proper. By that I mean a charism. It is not what you go and acquire in a school and you become a medical doctor. It is not what uh, uh, a priest would have to do on account of his ministry as a priest and go and anoint a sick person, which is very important. The sacrament of anointing the sick is very, very important, essential. But here, the charism, with reference to what Paul is saying, is another dimension altogether. Now, you also observe that when Paul comes to that, Paul says the charisms of healing. He uses the plural, charismata. So, this has led to various interpretations of that. And I'm going to point out the three interpretations from a biblical scholars. Uh, some say that, well, it is called charisms of healing because it points to the various healing graces that God gives to those who are sick. So here the emphasis is on the recipient of the healing graces. So it is not so much about somebody exercising the uh, uh, charism, but it's more of God bestowing uh, healing graces on our sick members in the community. That is one school of thought, and I'm sure you may have heard that from uh, some uh, interpretations. Another school of thought says, well, uh, it is called charisms of healing, or gifts of healing because 
Well, there are some people who have the, uh, the, the, the charism for healing malaria. Another person has a charism for healing tuberculosis. Another person has a charism for healing COVID-19. Another person has a charism for healing uh, leprosy. So there are different uh, charisms for healing. And that is why it is called charisms of healing or gifts of healing. That is another school of thought. A third one says, well, that is none of the two, but it's more of uh, an individual who has received grace of healing and the person is able to pray for various diseases and sicknesses. That's another one. Now, when scholars are divided like that, the best thing to do is to go to the teaching office of the church and go and find out what is the church saying about that text. So, come with me as we go to the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. We want to understand what they also say about that. And the congregation came out with a document. The title of the document is Instruction on Prayers for Healing. And that document was released on September 14, 2000. And I like to quote portions of that document. Now, concerning the charisms of healing or the gifts of healing, this is what the document says, and I'm quoting. These graces in the plural are attributed to an individual and are not, therefore, to be understood in a distributive sense as the gift of healing received by those who themselves have been healed, but rather as a gift granted to a person to obtain graces of healing for others. So the point here being made is that there are people in our Christian community who have received that grace of healing for others. So God has put into them that grace and then they go out there praying for people, for others. Now, who are these individuals? Are there particular categories of persons in the church who have that? Uh, the charism of healing, is it only for priests or is it for some, uh, some group in the church? The document addresses that and it says, and I continue, I quote, the charism of healing is not attributable to a specific class of faithful. It is quite clear that St. Paul, when referring to various charisms in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, does not attribute the gift of charisms of healing to a particular group, whether apostles, prophets, teachers, those who govern or any other. The logic which governs the distribution of such gifts is quite different. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who distributes to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11, end of quote. So the point being made here is that when it comes to the charisms of healing, anybody at all in the church can receive that from God. It is the Holy Spirit who decides. In other words, you don't have to be a priest to exercise the charisms of healing. There are lay faithful who have received the charisms of healing. And we are encouraged to exercise the, uh, uh, these charisms. So if you have the charisms of healing and you have a friend who is sick, please pray for that friend. You have a brother or a sister who is sick, please pray for that person. But then, if you want to have a a service in the church or you want to offer that charism to the bigger community in the church for this one please talk to the priest in charge and it will help you to follow the disciplinary norms for the church so that nobody will do whatever he or she wants because well I have the gift of healing so let me organize this and organize that if there is no order there will be confusion in the church so if you sense deeply that I have the charism of uh, miracle or the charisms of healing and you want to bring it to the service of the greater community, talk to it, talk about it with your priest in charge. And your priest in charge who is very much aware of the, uh, this document from the congregation, 
uh, of the doctrine of uh, faith, uh, the Commission for Doctrine of the Faith, the instructions on prayers for healing. Uh, this principle is very much aware of it. It will help you to follow the disciplinary norms so that it will, it will be done beautifully and that we will all benefit from God's graces and God's love. We've been talking about the charisms. Uh, it's not enough to talk about it. It is also important that we pray that God will shower his graces on us. And that is what we want to do this very moment. We want to ask God to strengthen us in his love. I do know that some have some concerns about how do I exercise my charisms within the hierarchical structure of the church. Tomorrow, the topic is the hierarchy and charisms. It's going to be an interesting topic. Don't miss it. The hierarchy and charisms. We'll see where... Uh, uh, cooperation and uh, how best we can uh, exercise our gifts in that dimension. So that will be for tomorrow. But for, for this moment, let us just pause and let each one of us become aware of God's presence. Wherever you are, the Spirit of God is there with you. And the Holy Spirit wants you to know that He loves you. Paul says that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit. At this moment, allow the Holy Spirit to love you. And as he is loving you, he wants you to know also that he has given you charisms. He has given you special graces. He wants you to be serviceable in the church. He wants you to have an impact in the church. This very moment, the Holy Spirit is filling you with power. He wants to use you. The question is, will you allow yourself? Will you allow yourself? Maybe once upon a time you were exercising one or the other charism, but because of something, you've stopped exercising that charism. You've stopped. The Holy Spirit is saying, pick up that charism once again. Pick it up. And if the Lord is going to use you mightily in that area, if it is tongue speaking, exercise it. If it is interpretation of tongues, exercise it. Prophecy, exercise it. Wisdom, exercise it. Knowledge, exercise it. The cement of spirit, exercise it. The gift of faith, please, go ahead, exercise it. The gift of miracle, use that gift. The gift of healing, please do that. All for the glory of God and also at the service of our brothers and sisters. And the Lord will certainly bless you and strengthen you. We now pray the litany of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Divine essence, one true God, have mercy on us. Spirit of truth and wisdom, have mercy on us. Spirit of holiness and justice, have mercy on us. Spirit of understanding and counsel, have mercy on us. Spirit of love and joy, have mercy on us. Spirit of peace and patience, have mercy on us. Spirit of kindness and goodness, have mercy on us. Spirit of generosity and gentleness, have mercy on us. Spirit of faithfulness and modesty, have mercy on us. Spirit of self-control and chastity, have mercy on us. Love substantial of the Father and the Son, have mercy on us. Love and life of saintly souls, have mercy on us. Fire ever burning, have mercy on us. Living water to quench the thirst of hearts, have mercy on us. From all evil, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From all impurity of soul and body, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From all gluttony and sensuality, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From all attachments to the things of the earth, 
Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from all hypocrisy and pretense. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from all imperfections and deliberate faults. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from our own will. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from slander. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from deceiving our neighbors. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit, from our passions and disorderly appetites. Deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From our inattentiveness to your holy inspirations, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From despising little things, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From debauchery and malice, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From love of comfort and luxury, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From wishing to seek or desire anything other than you, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. From everything that displeases you, deliver us, O Holy Spirit. Most loving Father, forgive us. Divine Word, have pity on us. Holy and Divine Spirit, leave us not until we are in possession of the Divine Essence, Heaven of Heavens. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, send us the Divine Consular. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, fill us with the gifts of your Spirit. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, make the fruits of the Holy Spirit increase within us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of your faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in this consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to turn to Jesus Christ and in this adoration and as we seek his face, we are praying particularly for those who need healing right now. So as we receive blessing from Jesus, we are praying for anybody out there who is sick. Be it a physical sickness or emotional or spiritual we pray that this very evening, the healing power of Jesus Christ will reach out to you. And in doing so, we are inspired by the example of Paul in Acts chapter 19, verse 11 to 12, where we read, And God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. If handkerchiefs of Paul were enough to bring healing to people, then the body of Jesus Christ can heal you this very moment. Put your faith in Jesus. And as we adore Jesus and his body is lifted, may you receive healing wherever you are and be restored and made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. 